So I was just saying we've split differentiation into these two sections. We're going to focus on mostly just the rules for the next few lessons because all um, differentiation feels like there's a lot of stuff going on. And if we can split this chapter into two kinds of things, it makes it a little bit easier to deal with some of that information that we've got here. So we're going to just be learning how to differentiate some new kinds of functions because right now the only things that you know how to differentiate are things like ax to the power of n. You know how to differentiate things like 3x to the power of a half, stuff like that. And actually, as you've probably seen from the amount of differentiate from the amount of uh, trigonometry you've been doing, there's loads more to maths than just these polynomials. So we're going to be wanting to learn how to differentiate things like sine x, the natural logarithm ln x things where x is in the power, exponential functions, and not just sine x, but all of the trig functions. We're going to want to learn how to differentiate. And we're going to learn three different rules that will help us to differentiate these things. And we'll obviously explain where these rules come from. They're called the chain rule, the product rule, and the quotient rules. And they're going to allow us to differentiate all kinds of things. And then the second half of this is going to be using these things and using those skills. But there'll still be some applications of this as we go through here. So we're going to get started right away. And where we like to think of here is we're going to think about differentiating the trig functions. That's probably going to be the first thing that I want to have a look at. And I'm telling you here that what does this d by dx thing actually mean? What does this mean? It means differentiate and very. it means with respect to x. So that means the variable that we're concentrating on that we're differentiating here is the x variable. And I'm telling you to begin with that sine of x differentiates to cos of x. So now you know if you had something like y equals sine x, you could differentiate it to find that dy by dx was cos x. But we are obviously going to do a proof for this, and this proof will or can come up in your exam. It came up in, in one of the previous exams. So this is not only something that you need to be able to understand, but it's something that you would need to be able to replicate as well. Now what I've done here is I have put in this bit, this is what comes in the formula book for differentiation from first principles. This is what you get in the formula book. So this might be your kind of like helpful starting point of what you would do to prove that sine x differentiates to cos x. And a few other things that we've got here as helpful facts is I've said that when x is a small number, sine x is approximately equal to x and cos x is approximately equal to 1 minus a half x squared. Well, where have those two things come from? What are they called? The small angle approximations. The small angle approximations. So do you remember when we looked at the small angle approximations, we may have said we need to use these later on in differentiation and integration, and this is where they're now coming into play. OK? So... If y is equal to f of x, so we're saying that if y is sine x, we're saying that sine x is f of x. We're going to find out the derivative by using this formula here. So f dash x is going to be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h is going to be sine of x plus h. So it's f of x, but I've put in a plus h in place of the x that we have there. And try and write this down as we go, because there's going to be quite a few things you're going to need to write. And we're subtracting f of x, and in this case, f of x is sine x. And then that whole thing is being divided by h. Now, the main thing that you'll find when you do these uh, proof differentiation from first principle questions is you're going to get majorly bored of writing this thing every time. But it does need to be there every time until you actually do the process of taking limits. So please make sure that thing I've just highlighted, that it is always there on every line until we get to the point when we take limits. It's boring to write, but it does need to be there. So we're going to say the limit as h approaches 0 of this thing. Now, there is something that we've got there that we've had to study trigonometry before we could do differentiation, and it's to do with this. What can I use on here? Not the double angle form, the addition formula, we call that one. But yeah, I know what you, you know what we mean here. So I'm going to expand those brackets, not obviously like in traditional expanding, but using the addition formula. So it would be sine x cos h plus cos x sine h minus the sine x that we've still got there from before like this, OK?
And so we're now going to see if we can do anything. This is the bit that's perhaps the hardest part to spot here. But what you should see is that we have got a sine x here and a sine x here. And so I'm going to pull those two things together by factorizing them. So what I'm going to do is I will factorize the sine x parts that we've got. So I have the limit as h approaches 0. I'm going to take out a factor of sine x. And I would have cos of h minus 1. And that's all being divided by h. I haven't finished the middle part yet. I haven't finished it. I've just dealt with these bits that I've done in red here. And I've also separated them into two separate fractions. If you want, I could have done it as this whole fra line fraction, and I'll show you that I'm going to separate it. And then I've also got plus cos x sine h all over h. So I'm actually going to separate that. I want this to be seen as two separate ones. And you'll see why in a second, OK? So now I've got it looking like that. I factorized it, and I split it into two separate fractions. I'm ready to start taking limits. Okay, I'm ready to start taking limits, which means I'm going to make h become really tiny. Now, when I make h become really tiny, I know what's going to happen to cos h, and I know what's going to happen to sin h as well because of the small angle approximations. So I'm just going to write down, perhaps at the side of the page, as h becomes really tiny, cos h becomes, well, from the small angle approximations, we know it's going to become 1 minus a half h squared from the small angle approximations. And we know that sine h is going to become uh, just h, because sine h just goes to h for small values. So that's from the small angle approximations. I'm now going to take all of these things, and I'm actually going to take limits, which means I'm going to no longer have to write this bit here, because I've already written as all of these things happen. So I would have uh, sine x. Now, cos h, we've said, is 1 minus a half h squared. Oh, I forgot the minus 1. So that's cos h minus 1 divided by h plus cos x multiplied by h over h. So we're nearly there. I suppose, actually, I probably should have still had the limits at the beginning. I, sh I still should have said, if you can squeeze it in, I still haven't actually taken limits yet. So the limit as h approaches 0. What does this bit here simplify to next to the sine x? Minus a half. Yeah, just h, because I've got h squared divided by h. The 1 and the minus 1 cancel, so I've just got minus a half h. And then the next bit, I just have cos x. No, because the h squared, when it divides by h, you just get h. So now, as h becomes 0, I would have 0 multiplied by minus a half multiplied by sine x, which is 0. And I would have cos x. So it's not, it's not super obvious how you need to do this, but it would be worth reviewing this. And when you're doing part of your revision, you might do a flashcard with this kind of proof on here. Now, I've done it. Pardon? Because as h becomes 0, I would have 0 times minus a half times sine x. So anything multiplied by 0 will become 0. This thing, because I had the h over h, completely cancelled out. Now, what I've got down here, if I remember this rightly, is 
this kind of thing is what we should have. As h goes to 0, maybe you're right, I should say. Um, as h goes to 0, I could say, if you wanted to, that also goes to 0. But as long as I've got this kind of like written somewhere in the problem as well. Now, the reason I've put this thing that I had sort of shrunk down is because I've done it in a slightly more challenging way than the exam question would have asked you. The exam question would have told you this. They would have told you that sine h over h goes to 1. And you can see here sine h over h is the thing that became 1 down here. And the other thing that I've got here is that cos h minus 1 over h goes to 0. And I can see that here, cos h minus 1 over h goes to 0. So I technically could have gone from this line straight down to the answer. But the reason I wanted to put in these other stages here is to make it crystal clear to you that this has come from small angle approximations. In the exam, they're more likely to give you this little extra hint that if you can make the sine h over h appear, then you can make it become 1. And if you can make the cos h minus 1 over h appear, then you can make it become 0. And so what's happened here is by using the definition of the derivative, we've said that the derivative of sine x is cos x. And you will do a similar kind of thing to this process to find out the derivative of cos x. Okay?